fact that our recycling pickup is every two weeks, and I always forget what day. And trash is every week, and I still forget that too. The fact that rituals don't stick in my head, and really, this should happen more often. The recycling pickup, I mean, not the rituals. The fact that people have come and gone in my life, but the one constant that has always remained has been spaghetti with shredded cheese melted on top. Rarely with any kind of tomato sauce, at least not at home, never really cared for it, just not my jam, no siree bob, cob, lob, lobe. Why are we going through all the trouble to make things more recyclable if we're not going to carry them off to get crushed into straws, laws, faux pas, key fobs? I lose my keys. I mean, I don't really lose them. I just can't remember what pocket they went in. I'm constantly patting myself down like a TSA dad who can't get the remote to work. The fact that I'd eat it all the same if it's part of a dish at a restaurant. I mean, really, would I just sit there and scrape the tomato off every single individual noodle to my satisfaction? And I'm not a monster, so I would never send it back to the kitchen just because I'm not wild about tomato, cuckoo for Cocoa Puffs. The fact that at some point it's just time to grow up and accept that tomatoes happen every now and then. No biggie, Biggie Smalls, Naomi Smalls, legs, dairy. The fact that I started wearing tighter pants, or maybe that my pants just became tighter, and now to compensate I'm top heavy with pockets. The fact that I told myself I would stop ordering things from Amazon, and now I have a pile of grinning corrugated in my room forever trapped in purgatory. You're trapped in here with me! The fact that every time I get home from work I throw my stuff in the same place, and this is the only ritual I know by heart, fart, pop art, Kmart. It was right by my first job at a movie theater, and there is, or was, or who knows now, a big Kmart right smack in the middle of Nicolette Street in Minneapolis. The fact that some people do though, I mean send food back in restaurants, not go cuckoo for Cocoa Puffs, though I guess that too. The fact that I wonder what goes on in their heads as they look another person in the eye and say, I actually don't want this, can you take it back? And not even for a hygienic reason, not for a hair or anything. The fact that people just send food back because it tastes different than they wanted it to taste, but at least you have food, so you might as well just eat it and get something else next time. Quit your crying. You can't cry all day, Sara Lee, Sarah Palin. Cuckoo for Cocoa Puffs, Bird Brain, Toucan. And who even shops at Kmart anymore? When they close the Kmart, what happens to the stuff inside? I bet they stuff it into smiling boxes and ship it to people like me, who tear at it with glee for a brief moment and live with the guilt of lining Bezos' pockets. I didn't buy my extra pockets at Kmart, and now they're laying in the same spot they always are, trapped in their own purgatory. You are trapped in here with me. The fact that it might be more efficient for me to just have everyone bring their recycling here, and I'll melt it into copies of Middle March for Penguin. The fact that I can't pr uh, practice this ritual means that Penguin Random House will become Random House in 50 years, because no one will remember what a penguin was. The fact that future generations probably won't know what a real-life toucan looks like, and a whole bunch of other animals too, but at least they'll have virtual reality so they can go virtual paragliding with their virtual pet cockatoo named Reginald. Or it could be a Crovid random house. Crovids will inherit the earth. They practice more rituals than I do. Drill baby drill, drill till you drop crop top. They would never forget to set the bins out. Hello, and welcome to Unprotected Texts, the show where we get up close and personal with some great books. Mm -hmm. I'm Matt. And I'm Jacob. And today we will be talking about the wonderful and fabulous <laughs> Ducks Newburyport by one Lucy Elman. Oh, I like that. So, Ducks Newburyport by Lucy Elman um, was shortlisted and longlisted. Not in that order. Not in that order. Which it, we'll talk about the Booker Judges later. Yeah. We'll get to them. Uh, in a perfect world which is the world of Alice in Wonderland, all have won and all shall have prizes. <laughs> this is her eighth novel. Um, no, I, I have not read anything else by her, Matt. No, neither have I. Um, um, I've tried to get my hands on the others, but it's proving tricky. Um, her father was uh, probably the most famous James Joyce biographer. We um, have one of his books. Yeah, yeah. yeah. He, he um, admittedly, um, I haven't read it or know much about James Joyce besides the plot. Or Ulysses. Or Ulysses. I haven't I, read it. Haven't, Matt, I haven't, I haven't read Ulysses. Wake me after the beating. And I will say just this, Lucy Elman is a goddamn delight. 
She's a genius. That is my favorite part of this whole process, was just reading interviews and listening to her. She is... I mean, she's one of my new favorite authors, hands down. Each one is better than the last. Yeah, like it, it just gets better and better. Just if even if you don't read Doug's Newberry Report, just read her interviews. Mm -hmm. um, I'll link them down here um, in the in the show notes. Uh, she's now in my pantheon, even though I've only read this. She's officially in the pantheon of my favorite mm -hmm. authors, especially the living authors. I think it goes like, I mean, Kurt Vonnegut mandatory top for me. We'll talk. We'll we'll do an episode. Um, and then, I don't know, a bunch of middling, mm -hmm. but then Lucy Elman's up there. I mean, I don't know. For me, uh, Fran Lebowitz was pretty much, um, by default, number one. This is not something I believe, by the way, <laughs> right? I, I don't believe any of this, you know? Mm -hmm. Well, not that, like, I had a problem with her writing, but, um, uh, yeah, so it's, it's, uh, off the top of my head, Fran Lebowitz and Lucy Elman. Um, Good choices. Oh, uh, oh, oh, Kate Atkinson. Kate Atkinson is also at that table. I haven't read any Kate Atkinson. I mean, I would just go for the good one, and that's Life After Life. The good one? As, okay. I mean, I mean, she's known for... The good she, one. She, <laughs> I don't mean it like that. I just mean she's she's known for, like, mysteries. Oh, yes. Like, that sort of yeah. genre. But mm -hmm. um, Life After Life is really not that way. Okay. And it's um, well, you know, very thoughtful, but time travel but not with like a sci-fi gimmick okay. like it, it's very knowing and well paced and well constructed okay. and a lot of pathos but not schmaltzy okay that's fair yeah um i am a sucker for a sci-fi gimmick though and genre but let's talk about duck's newberry port right proper here um the book the book and i feel like we have to the get legend. into the legend the myth the legend <laughs> I remember it was a Saturday. I'm pretty sure you were not uh, working, and oh this was God. back when I was still doing um, the new books. Mm -hmm. um, but I remember uh, four four copies of this came in uh, along Which is with about 15 feet high. Yes, yeah, it's it, it takes up a lot of real estate, and uh, you need you need the air rights first before yeah. you can put it out. Oh god, the FAA just all over <laughs> ass. Anyway. But we also got it with a bunch of other books that had been long listed for the Man Booker Prize. And so I was like, oh, this is great. I'll just make some space on the new table. And I put two copies out, which as you can see is plenty of space to just putting out two copies with some other long listed. And that Saturday, both of them sold off mm -hmm. the table. I made it a face out and I think within like two hours somebody else picked it up and I happened to be at the register when they came up to check it out and I was just overcome <laughs> with curiosity. I usually don't do this and I just like asked this lady, I was like, excuse me, I don't mean to bother you but I just have to know. Um, did you come in here looking for this book or did you just pick it up and read the back and think that it looked interesting? And she was like, no, I just like started flipping through and I read the cover and, and the back cover and it just seemed really fascinating. And so my curiosity just grew and grew and I would like keep coming back to it and I would just like look through it. And I, I mean, just even just to like flip through it and look at just the huge blocks of text page after page, it was just captivating and just mm -hmm. read individual little sections and like phrases here and there are just half a page because you literally are just like jumping into the middle of this uh, middle-aged housewives thought process. Mm. Take the plunge and just go for it. Um, but I didn't for a long time and I just would not shut up about it. And no, hold on. We need to take, we need, you're not doing yourself this justice. He would not, when he says he wouldn't shut up about it, he means he took on the mantle. He he put on paladin armor just of Duck's Newberry Port mm -hmm. to be like, this is the book I will fucking kill for. <laughs> Very pushy. He literally pushed it into I, the hands of a woman who later collapsed. Yeah. But she bought but she, it. She didn't sue. No, and That's she bought the, the book. Thing. She did. Yeah. So. She's happy. I mean, she's not going anywhere for a while, so no, she I mean, needs reading material. Yeah, she's, the attraction is, is hard. But So mm -hmm. I, I've been pushing hard. And that's fair. Um, um, just real quick, we'll get into obviously deeper details, but having now read it, um, do you still feel that way? Quite a bit, yes. Yeah, yeah. I, re I mm -hmm. certainly my favorite novel of 2019. Yeah. Um, one of my new favorite books of all time. 
but somebody said lazy readers rejoice or like lazy readers need not look away because I mean just to look at the heft of this thing mm -hmm. it's a thousand pages nearly mm -hmm. um, and lazy readers might be put off by it or think that it's like a huge commitment and it is in time but not necessarily in uh, in mental capacity or intellectual power. Yeah, just for myself, my own journey was kind of the opposite of Matt's. Yeah, so you read this okay. out of spite, well, I did, okay. more or less. More or less. Anyway, but this was in the consortium catalog because this is published by Biblio Oasis in the United States. Published by Bloomsbury UK? Yes. Bloomsbury UK, UK in um, the UK. Um, but Biblio Oasis, which is an independent publisher out of Canada, and I haven't, not too familiar with them, I usually pride myself. Ontario. 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 Good to know. Ontario. I, not even kidding. On the way back here from yes. um, Target, mm -hmm. after grocery shopping, mm -hmm. I was driving behind someone with an Ontario plate, oh. and their motto was, I think it was, yours to discover. <laughs> what a passive-aggressive Canadian way. I don't know what you can do, Dar, I guess. You can... Uh, Take it or leave it. Take it or leave it there. I mean, you walk down the street, you might <laughs> no, see something cool, or maybe you won't um, uh, see it there. That's Winnipeg's. Uh, oh, yeah, this is more of an Oyoki with a Yoper mm -hmm. with accent there. It's all I can really do there. I'm from Minnesota there, so I'm like, I this one there. I can't really do the other Canadian accent there. So, you know, take it or leave it. Right. You know? <laughs> that's mighty decent of you, eh? Yeah. Hey, my name's Rut. This is my brother, Tuke. How's it going, Bear? I want to read this copy and then tell you. One, how I reacted to it, and then two, how I am now finding it to be just basically lies. Mm -hmm. Okay, so this is the copy. This is directly from the Consortium Catalog, Fall yeah, 2019. Lay it on me. Okay. Um, a form-breaking torrent of consciousness narrated by an Ohio mother besieged by MAGA hats and mountain lions. Yeah. Fucking risky. Fucking this is Trump's America. Like this is that's my thing. It per, it per, all of, all of this to say, which hope thank please dear God, Jacob. Listen, edit, listening to him say that, listening to him say that, did did that not sound like a gimmick, like slipping in that it's all one sentence? It sounds on paper like a gimmick. It's all one sentence. I broken will... up, broken up periodically, like every eighty pages. Yes. By this story of a mountain lion. Yes. So there is a mountain lion. With her cubs. There's a mountain lion, but here's my big problem: how many maga hats are there? Very few. Very, very few. She's not besieged by maga hats or trigger. There's, there's that one interview where she even says specifically that in a novel that is about four hundred fifty thousand words. The, the word Trump shows up 300 times, yeah. which is just a drop in the bucket. It's, so it's not like it's all about... Yeah. yeah, I get what they're trying to do. I get what they're trying to pitch it, because this feels like a very difficult book to pitch. Having mm -hmm. pitched it to customers ourselves, it's kind of a, a walk to get people to come mm -hmm. through the door. You have to be like, Ooh, no, don't be afraid. Don't be afraid. It's in, only a thousand in my pages. Case, in my case, they just want to leave. They're like... I'll give you the money, mister, just please let me go. <laughs> you buy this fucking book. They you buy this my, book, man. They see my eyes and they're like, okay, just okay, give me the just, money. Just give, just, just <laughs> give the addict his fix, we'll move on, we won't think about it ever again. Um, we'll go have a nice dinner and forget that we ever saw that. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> we out here, and up here, in the same time and place addict. as we were before, yeah. nothing has changed in nothing. no way, nothing at all, same mm -hmm. day. No, time has passed. Um, where the <laughs> fuck were we? Um, editing. So I read this book pretty much out of spite, uh, to spite Matt, to try and bring him down from this high yeah. euphoric place mm -hmm. he had brought himself to. Mm -hmm. um, so I got it in November. I read it um, pretty quickly, actually. Uh, uh, it was also over break. It was also over break. I had a little vacation. I went home, uh, flew home over, over Thanksgiving. Um, so I had a lot of... I mean, I'm one of those people who's like, oh, I gotta get to the airport like seven hours early because security's totally, gonna be real bad. Totally. Security's gonna be real bad, guys. Don't worry, I know what I'm doing. I've flown on planes mm -hmm. a lot of times. Look, I'm taking off my shoes. Shoes off, belts Look, I'm off, taking off my shoes, out. my belt. Look, look, my, my keys. Here's my, my ID. All the stuff that's Let in the bin. Touch you. Yep, yeah. go ahead. Touch away. Do it. Yep, right there. That's good. <laughs> thank you. Yes, thank you. Goodbye. Uh, I came around to it. I really went in wanting to hate this book. I went in with the expressed purpose of disliking this book. Mm -hmm. And I came out of it just just absolutely loving it. It sucks you in. Even going back, even when I was going back to take notes for, for this, I just kept 
finding myself getting sucked in. I was like, oh, I gotta find that passage. And then I would start reading and I would just find myself just flipping Keep pages. Going. It just pulls you right mm -hmm. in. And I think I know a little bit of why I personally started really catching on to it. Okay. And this is highly specific, so I apologize. But it reminds me of an Aesop Rocks flow. Like Aesop Rocks early like later stuff you have no idea I what i'm no talking idea, about i might play you a clip later um but like asap rock's later stuff where his like last few singles where it's just a total rant there's no hook there's no um verses the fact that i often wish i could just get the kids to school and go right back to bed the fact that what would be the harm except that the neighbors might find out i'm a slut slob sn uh, slug a bed the fact that i shouldn't use the word slut i mean not slug a bed the fact that all women are not sluts, the people who behave strangely are not insane. The fact that the college rapist was a swimming star at Stanford, the Harvard of the West, and he raped a drunk girl and dumped her behind a dumpster. The fact, the fact that... Yeah, for, for real, after reading this book, I will never hear the words, the fact that, or uh, say them, or think of them without thinking about this book. So it is like everywhere, and it mm -hmm. works. It's not annoying, at least not to me. Was it annoying to you? No, it it it. Because um, some Amazon reviewers, not that they're like the cream of the crop, but um, cut cut. A fair amount of them would say that it was just like annoying to have to read um, the fact that over and over. And like one guy even said, like, I shudder to think about the minutes and hours that I've wasted just reading those three words I mean, over and over. It's a lot of the book. But, but it works. But it works. It, it really it does. Gives it, uh, it gives it a very distinct rhythm and distinctive voice. And I don't know if this is because Aesop Rock is also from the Midwest. So I Where? Don't, um, well, I guess he lived in New York World, but he's from Minneapolis. The same torrent of consciousness that feels very authentic to at least us Midwesterners. We're both from the Midwest. Mm -hmm. And I feel like I don't know if that plays a part in it. What do you think? Do you think? Well, I don't think East Coasters will, like, read this and be like this no. simpleton. Um, but, I mean, Lucy Elman did in interviews. She does specifically say that she had like a Midwestern archetype uh, and other women that she knew from real life mm -hmm. who are still in the Midwest and living that way. She had them in mind and wrote with. Um, their tics and their mannerisms and their way of yeah. speaking and their way of looking at the world. And in that way, it really does ring true. I mean, like you just, in the thing that you just read mm -hmm. where she's like, oh, I really shouldn't use the word slut. Yes. Like to this day, even if my mother is like quoting something directly from an article or, or a book mm -hmm. or something like that, and it has even like but, like the word but in it, or like a mild curse word that you learn yeah. in like fifth grade, yeah. she'll be like, oh, excuse me for saying this. Yeah. So like, there's definitely that like timidness and like wanting to be polite and sort of shove some of the nastier <laughs> thoughts down. Keep your fucking opinions to yourself. Right. When someone says how you are, you say, oh, I'm okay. Yeah. I'm okay, thanks. Yeah. I'm good. Another thank, cheese thank curd, you. please. Thank you. Kevin. nope, yep, nope. Oh, oh, sorry. <laughs> oh. Oh, just gonna sneak right by oh, it Sorry, in. they think never bothered the scrappy Bobby Nelson cheese shop. They offered more than enough to wrestle people into their doors. Customers would come through the door and they would just say, Oh my gosh, this store is so small. However, it was packed full. Oh, you wouldn't know that now by looking around. Everything's gone. <laughs> There's not a slice of Munster or an ounce of summer sausage to be had. She gripes about people. Um, the, the narrator, the, the unnamed narrator, um, she gripes about people, including Fre Freesia, is that how yep. you would say the name? I yeah, I so Freesia. one of her kids has a friend whose name is James. James's mom, Freesia, mm -hmm. um, comes over to the house because she says she wants to like just see the place. Mm -hmm. And the narrator finds her going through her underwear drawer. Yeah. And um, she's like really startled by that and is sort of like, you know, saying like who is this person who does she think she is she's like this and that and then but like the next breath she's like oh but i shouldn't say that yeah about her and i'm like no you should that's you should. like a weird thing yeah also i realized before even okay. she did well, that she was looking for guns i knew that yes she yes. didn't realize that till like yes. two pages later and i was like hello she's hello. looking for guns yes um also, I'm sorry about the time that you caught me looking for your guns in your underwear drawer, but I that was just to I look have for a drawer, guns. I have a crate. <laughs> That's true. You, and I had to pry it open yeah. with a pry. I don't know if he nails it back. Mm -hmm. Do you nail it back every together? Day. Every wow. Okay. You have to commit. Okay. Look, you do. Again, you do you. Mm -hmm. 
I'm not, I'm not here to it's judge. It's for the rustic simplicity. Fair enough. Of, that Fair I enough. Like. Is this an unreliable narrator? No. Our... Well, no. Ha? No, with conditions. I think that... I think that she is telling the truth. Like, she's not a... She's not aware of the reader. So, like, it's not like she's telling you all of this stuff and she's, like, aware of the audience. Um... I think it was Katie Waldman in The New Yorker who noticed the whole thing about, um, like, the narrator would say, like, ass or butt or cock, and she'd be like, oh, no, 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 what's wrong with me? I shouldn't think that thing. And Katie thought that that had to do with the fact that the narrator was aware of the reader. I don't think that that's the case. Now, is the narrator completely aware of herself and her own psyche and her own... Mm -hmm habits and tics and like her own faults and shortcomings. I don't think so, but that doesn't mean that she's like trying to pull a fast one. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? She's not fully consciously aware because another part of that is she says she has a terrible memory, mm -hmm. but like fully 40% of this is flashback. So this is why I asked this question because first off, points me, I asked a great question. So take you that did. Tom Broca. Um, oh, 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 <laughs> thank you. Anytime. I'll keep it right in there. <laughs> uh, but this is my favorite kind because it is the most honest form of an unreliable narrator. It's mm -hmm. just the lies we all tell ourselves completely all the time to, about about ourselves, about our image. She has um, clear body issues, body issues yes. with herself. Um, um, but she even shoves those down too mm -hmm. a little bit. She'll like, kind of like, oh, I'm playing, like, oh, you know, my husband and I have this odd sex life, kind of, or you know, they have a, they have a married sex life. Yeah. With four, uh, kids. with four kids, um, and you know this is another f form of anxiety for her, and she feels conscious about her body, um, like we all do. And then sometimes we're like, "Oh, but I shouldn't think that way," mm -hmm. or all this. And so, and when, and I feel like when she is retelling events, because again, a lot of this book is told in flashback, um, quite effectively, I will add. Mm -hmm. um, it's not like an episode. It's not like, and now I'm going to. Yeah. relay to you, it, it just happens. It's just yes. weaved into the thought process yes. and the narrative. Yes, and it comes up sporadically, like it, like thoughts do, mm -hmm. things do. Um, uh, there was a, a band uh, playing at uh, my other job, not the bookstore job. All of a sudden I walk out to the front and um, Streetly Manifesto is playing and all of a sudden I'm back in a in my friend's car in high school, going mm -hmm. to Chicago mm -hmm. to, to see them. And it's like that kind of, those kind of memories just crop up incidentally mm -hmm. and they do for her too you know she'll see some Lysol and then she'll mm -hmm. go on a, a whole binge and it'll bring up memories about her family and her mom and her dad or like a glass and she, or like a specific type of like bubble glass yes and she'll think about her horrible grandmother yes and and it feels very natural and but at the same time she's giving you very important information that ties into the themes that ties into the the narrative structure um, and that's the real magic trick of Ducks Newburyport for me is to engage you not just with these wonderful little, uh, I guess not little, 80 page long thought exp uh, thought explosions, um, but to c convey quite easily and, and delightfully um, a whole narrative about this woman's life and her family's life and how she views different members of her family. Um, that's, that's to me the real magic of it and not how many MAGA hats and Trump tweets she has to worry about. Mm -hmm. And I just realized that when the monologue in my head finally stops, I'll be dead. Or at least totally unconscious, like a vegetable or something. Someone else on Amazon thought that this took place over a day. Which is dumb. <sighs> that is dumb because it clearly doesn't. <laughs> right, I think it starts in January, which I thought was cool because I started reading this in January. So I was like, oh, how atmospheric. Cute. Um, but I think it goes all the way up through like April. I think it like so. jumps like a you, few weeks. You finished it much more recently, but it definitely ju it definitely jumps ten times. Yeah. I also want to highlight this: the breaks of the mountain lion and mm -hmm. her cubs, um, which are told with a lot of punctuation. Right. And those don't count. They don't count. Oh my god! It's so interesting. It doesn't count. It doesn't count. You. It doesn't count. You, look, you you and Lucy Elman agree. Right, because we're right. I, I, clearly, I just... I, it doesn't count. You know what? Sometimes you got to be comfortable with being wrong. She fully breaks. It's a full break. But, okay, you know what? Fine. I'm not but here to argue this. One thing I will say to you, I get, I sort of get the confusion why some 
uh, publications erroneously reported that it was six sentences, which it's not. It's one. But interestingly enough, um, the first time I ever actually saw a period in the part of the novel where it is her thought process is when she picks up a newspaper and she reads the headline, oh, yeah. Mountain Lion Found or Spotted in Ohio County, period, mm -hmm. Police Respond, period. Mm -hmm. That was really interesting mm -hmm. that when these two narratives start to intersect, that's where, I mean, it really was jarring, like seeing a period smack dab in the middle of this massive block of text. Yeah. And you, I mean, it was in quotation, so it was in a newspaper. Again, it doesn't count. Um, I wasn't counting those. It doesn't way. count. I wasn't. But okay. it was just really inventive and clever on her part. Absolutely. Absolutely. The fact that the raccoons have given up raiding our trash for the day, but traffic sounds have taken their place, and now the chickens are trying to outdo the car noise, the fact that they're always on the move and always in such a tearing hurry. People, not chickens, though also chickens. The fact that where can they all be going, screeching around the corner like maniacs. So the fact that she has to clarify what she's talking about in mm -hmm. a clause like that where she's using pronouns. I mean, some of them are funny, and certainly in like the first hundred pages, I thought that it was funny and Absolutely. I would like enjoy to see what kind of things, what dichotomy she's going to like shove together because that can be humorous. Absolutely. But sometimes it does get old. And and uh, I will say though, real quick, that th this is a funny book. It really is. Sometimes, I laughed a sometimes lot. Sometimes it is just so stupid. It is just so stupid. Like yes. it literally opens with yes. after the first um, mountain lion yeah. part for like a page and a half. It literally opens with the fact that the raccoons are playing around with our trash in the gar in the in the driveway. Mm -hmm. it, that's yeah. what a way to begin things. Very, Elman, very well crafted. Elman wrote a thousand page long novel that is one sentence, not to prove anything, but just because she thought, why should I have to end a sentence? I wanted to trace someone's thought patterns, and I don't think thinking is punctuated in the brain. Okay, so this is a quote I pulled from a Lucy Elman interview, which again, look those up, um, where she talks about, the interviewer asks her essentially like, you read you don't read contemporary fiction a lot. Right. And she's like, no, I don't. She literally says, after the atom bomb, I don't read novels. Yes, and this is why, she says. I don't st uh, stick strictly to this policy, but I often find it more re rewarding to read what people thought about and what they did with literature before we were reduced by war and capitalism to mere monetary units, bomb fodder and password generators, and before the natural world That's became a depository gross. for plastics and, nu uh, and nuclear wastes. Which, I love this quote. That's a great quote. Right? I'm like tearing up <laughs> no, thinking about it's great. that. It's great. Um, but I only, I, I say that quote because um, I want, my only real problem with this book is I don't, I don't want it to be in our narrator's head. And I right. know that's a big okay. problem. Yeah. Let me, let me just, let, let okay. me just spell this out cause I, I know because, you disagree with me. Right. I've, he's said before, I wish that this took place in anybody else's head. Yes. And now I want you to explain yourself. Yes. Okay. The only thing I didn't really like is I wish it had been set in any other person's brain. Oh, why did she write a book that is so expressively trapped in mm -hmm. in this moment in time? Now, I, again, appreciate the project, love the project. Maybe it's because of what I read in general, or maybe it's just because of, of my personal taste. I mean, it is. Who am I kidding? It is because of my personal taste. I wanted this style of novel to take place outside of my own anxieties. Mm -hmm. Like, she talks a lot about environmentalism, a lot about worries, the shit that, ooh, no, I'm gonna burp. Um, edit it out. Edit it out. I have already a, 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 a trap, a cavalcade of anxieties very much related to her. When I was little, I used to be terrified that a black hole would just fly by our solar system mm -hmm. just enough to put the Earth's, uh, the rotation of our solar system off whack, that our Earth would go flying either into the cold distance of space or right into the sun. It does give you social anxiety. It does give me a lot of anxiety, and I don't need that, and I don't need it for this moment. 
so, your quotes about from yes. Lucy Ellman's interviews. I wanted to read some quotes of interviews which will refute a lot of things I initially complained about mm -hmm. um, directly. <laughs> um, so, first off, this book is very heavy. Man, it's so heavy. I, oh, God. It's, oh, it's, God. It's just like a quarter pounder with cheese. <sighs> but she addresses this issue in, a, in, I think, a very good way. Um, in this, uh, can I say that I also suspect it would not be such an issue if I were not female? Men can take liberties. A, a woman writing a long book is considered audacious, if not outrageous. Our novels, like us, are supposed to be petite, so many male reviewers have complained about this book's size. And I feel, I fear male upper body strength might not be all it's cracked up to be. Come on, guys, it's just a novel, not 7,000 pages of Wikipedia. It's really not. Uh, I'm hot! Women don't get to write long books. Right. It's Donna Tartt. Very few people. And the person we haven't read... George Eliot. George Eliot. <laughs> Middle March. <laughs> Middle March. And that's kind of it. And yeah, I... we're struggling to like think of uh, long, long-ass books written by women. Yeah, it's a problem. Um, not with, with us and the publishing industry in general. Yeah, they just um, get a lot of flack for it and it's like total BS. Yes. She gets asked about symbolism and she essentially says, Symbolism yeah. is cheap, um, which makes total sense because one of the events that happens uh, in the narrative, a major plot point is she and her four kids are going to the mall and uh, also in the car that she's driving, she's got the pies and the cakes that she bakes mm -hmm. to sell to like small businesses to make a little extra money, that sort mm -hmm. of thing. Um, but she has to deliver them herself, so they stop at the mall. And while they're there, uh, like a major storm hits the area, a torrential rain, and a flash flood occurs. There's like a small river that goes under the bridge that is like the main entrance and exit out of the mall, I guess. And so it carries away the bridge um, because there's suddenly this flash flood, and literally being carried down that river in that flood is a person's house and she notices that like a cat jumps out of one of the windows onto the roof of the house mm -hmm. and into the river and then sort of like disappears from view. So yeah. like me reading that, I was like, okay, this has to like mean something. She must be like trying to say something. So what does the house symbolize? Is that like civilization and like cities and like the folly of man and yeah. like making things and is the cat like, you know, people and koalas in Australia and <laughs> that sort of thing, and the, yeah. the flood is... But it's not a one-to-one -one ratio here. She's not trying to be, like, totally, like, in Great Gatsby, like, the green light symbolizes yeah. Daisy and money and yeah. blah, blah, blah. But he did not know that it was already behind him. Gatsby believed in the green light. Because if, if you were just reading her thought process, and if literally nothing happened in the book, and plenty does happen, it's not like it's just random thoughts. Things do happen, and she comments on yeah. them, so that's how you know that they're happening. Yes. Um, if nothing happened, you would think that she was just a basket case, staying at home mm -hmm. all day. Yeah. But a lot of her internal worries reflect the external world yeah. that happens around her, and yeah. then eventually to her directly. Yes. Normally you'd be like, ah, well, there's no deeper meaning, what's the real point? And you're like, no, that's the point. Mm -hmm. The point is, things are fucked up, and she's really worried about it, and she's got a family to protect. Completely. At one point you said you didn't think Leo was a good person. Yes. Um... You, that you like, you thought he was a bad guy, he gave you the creeps or something yeah. like that. Uh, explain yourself. Fair enough. Um, <laughs> no, it's fine. The the husband. Husband. Oh, wait, excuse me? Did you just say let's, let's talk about not, the husband? Let's not talk about what you don't want to help. To me, he came across as, um, as well-meaning but arrogant. Like, mm -hmm. just like, I know what's best. I am the man in this situation. You've had you've had a previous marriage, and you fucked that up. So let me take well, care so of this he. one. So did he. So did he. So did he. But he doesn't view it that way. Mm -hmm. At least that's how it came across to me. Now again, none of this is really not not like the flood. None of this is as explicitly stated. But I feel like a lot of her anxieties about the marriage come from him being. If we were in his brain, it would just be like a flat line of confidence with like maybe a boner here and there. <laughs> Like, 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 you know, it would just be like, hmm, I'm, 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 you know. But here's the question. Yes. Does confidence beget boners or do boners beget confidence? 
Oh. Discuss below. There was one time somewhere in like the 400s or something <laughs> where she's like making pies and like working in the kitchen and she specifically says that sometimes when Leo like comes into the kitchen, mm -hmm. it like creeps her out yeah. and like his presence like yeah. suddenly being there unnerves her, mm -hmm. something like that. And then also the time when he, she recounts that he's like getting ready to go leave on one of his business trips. Mm -hmm. um, and he like, he delays packing and he, it, it's just a mess. It's a last right, minute I slapdash thing. And like they're sort of like tense around each other and like should she call for the cab should mm -hmm. she double check the cab should she like check on her husband should she just let him be and he, she hears him clipping his toenails so i i will disagree in that i don't think he's like uh he's probably arrogant but i really think that i think she accurately represents just the the unblissfulness that married life can be that's true, and I and I will also say that she still is very deeply in love with him. Oh, absolutely, and and again, Leo is not expressly ever described or or does anything in the novel that you're like, oh shit, yeah. Leo, fucking don't you ever talk about my husband? Don't you ever? <laughs> you don't ever. You don't want out for everybody to know. You better want him to talk about me, or everybody will know. Never. Everybody will know my husband. Everybody. Even in a ostensibly healthy marital relationship, there's always there's Something. always some yeah. tentacle of the patriarchy. Yeah. So, in the 600s, for about 30 pages, mm -hmm. there's a break in the texture. Yes. Oh, this is my favorite. We come to this section where, if you can see that, it's not nearly as oppressive. Um, and it's just like individual phrases per line. Mm -hmm. And that's the way it is for about 30 pages. Mm -hmm. So why do you think she put that in there that way? Why the sudden... I think it is motivated by the character and all the things she's about to go through. Mm -hmm. um, it, kind of, it kind of sets you all up. It's, it's, like, it's like an act break, mm -hmm. really, too. It's like end of act two. Mm-hmm. I don't know. Everything's been set up because at that point, um, I mean, I'm a little fuzzy I mean, on where it falls, but it, but it, but in the next 300 pages, mm -hmm. a lot of shit goes down. You mean in the next or here? Here. Oh, completely. Yeah. Completely. Yeah. The last 200 pages, she had me by the balls. Yeah. She really did. And I think that I think that break is literally to just be like to remind to remind us that because I want to stress, even though it doesn't look like it has a lot of structure, this book is incredibly well structured. Yes. And that, I think, is an excellent part of it, where it is just, like, curtain act two. And that's why I think. I don't know if you had a different theory. I think just on, like, a smaller level, because so much of her, so much of her thought process ends in, like, uh, this sort of downward spiral of anxiety and doubt and being unsure and mm -hmm. socially awkward and um, all these worries and, like, her kids and Stacy, mm -hmm. her relationship with Stacy isn't good. But I think that that break... It's, it certainly starts out that way with, like, she literally goes, she sets out to list the things that she knows for certain. And some of it is, like, you know, easy things, like, the sun will rise. Mm -hmm. um, but sometimes it can be funny, like, um, she associates the word threesomes with Bill and Hillary Clinton. And yes. she's like, the Clintons will continue to be married yes. in their own way. Yes. Like, it, it literally says that. <laughs> yeah. So it, it's more of a positive, more affirmative shift. So that's what I picked okay, up on. Okay, that's fair. That's fair too. Um, yeah, I mean, I agree with that. I didn't really, I guess I didn't really think about that at the time. Mm -hmm. Well, just think about all of her, um, like right before you get to a break in her thought process where mm -hmm. it shifts back to the mountain lion mm -hmm. for about two pages or mm -hmm. so. Usually right before that, there's like a downward spiral and she comes, she keeps coming That's back to point. mommy, yeah. I'm broken, her yeah. sickness broke yes. me. And she yes. literally ends up sobbing in the bathroom yeah. more than once. Absolutely. Um, That's a very good point, Matt. He made a, Matt, you know what that point you gave me earlier? <sighs> Here's it back. Oh God. Oh, that poor point. Oh my God. So short lived. It tastes like sriracha. <laughs>
<laughs> that's just because I have it on. That's what I'm wearing. <laughs> Is that one of your creams, the sriracha? That's that just makes... one of my creams. Yeah. <laughs> As you were saying, there's just so much thought behind it, and an analogy that um, I keep coming back to with this is you just notice um, the incredible thought behind it. Um, and it's it's like needlepoint. So if you've ever, I've, ne I've never done it, but if you look at the <laughs> underside of the needlepoint, um, it's just like a jumbled mess of a bunch of like okay. um, lines and knots and that okay. sort of thing. I think I see. Um, but when you flip it over and it's like the side that you like show everybody, you put on your pillow, whatever, mm -hmm. it's like this beautiful, uh, well, clean, yeah. usually symmetrical thing. So there's so much going on and it's like, like I was saying before mm -hmm. about how usually at the end of the like 80 or 100 pages mm -hmm. or so, she usually has like a downward spiral. Mm -hmm. um, but even on like a larger thing, like I think I remember the words euphoria and nap came up always together. Oh, yeah. And mm -hmm. I, I would wonder like, why is euphoria and nap always coming together? And you just don't know why you always mm -hmm. see them together. Yeah. And it's not until literally somewhere in the 700 pages that you get that flashback and that story yeah. of how when the narrator was like five, she was having a nap Mm -hmm. And she just felt so euphoric waking up from that nap and everything was right with the world and she was so happy and mm -hmm. content, glad to be alive. Yes. She comes downstairs and wants to share that feeling with mm -hmm. her mother, who she loves so much. Mm -hmm. And her mom just sort of like gives her the cold shoulder and is yeah. like, that's nice, dearie. Yeah. And that's really like one of the first major points where she realizes that she and her mother are not going to see eye to eye on everything and that yeah. she's not always her mother isn't always going to be there for her yeah, absolutely absolutely every single thing including the list of household products which mm -hmm. while there's not really a lot of like huge long lists in the book everything comes back all those little references to chemicals products dupont mm -hmm. um the environment the, the different creeks different creeks yeah. um oh you want to talk about the bear map or the the, the yeah the mountain line the bear map different map <laughs> check grinder um Folsom, Folsom street festival Folsom street festival <laughs> anyway but you want to talk about the mountain line now yeah so i it comes back to the whole spiraling thing um because if you look at the literal map and you can insert it or whatever mm -hmm. um looking at the map the lion literally makes like a spiral and it gets into a tighter coil mm. until eventually yeah, okay. she gets um you know stuff something happens to her i won't spoil it but yeah. w where she ends up it so the whole map is like a spiral mm -hmm. and a lot of the the character and the psychology of this narrator is mm -hmm. the same sort of thing and okay yeah after the yeah, final yeah. after the final big thing that happens that again we won't spoil no, because it is like seriously so gripping like as she's like processing through what happened and everything that went down she doesn't it's not like a positive it's not a super uplifting thing and she still ends up sobbing in the mm -hmm. bathroom and yes. she's like hysterical and so down on herself in an emergency and like mm -hmm. is constantly doubting herself so it's just this like cyclical thing mm -hmm. i did not catch up on that i admittedly just dismissed the map i was like that's cute <laughs> and i moved on dead canaries like everywhere just for okay, the coal fine, mines whatever yeah, yeah. <laughs> my bit of advice just for how to read this because yes there are really no chapter breaks that sort of thing you can try and read the 80 pages at a time just to like make it to the next part where the mountain lion comes back. Mm -hmm. Sometimes you don't always have that time, so I would just have to stop. Mm -hmm. I would try and stop at the top of the left hand of one of the pages and read down a little bit. So that way when I came back, I would look at that mm -hmm. and look at the previous two pages. And just because otherwise I would be like, I don't exactly remember where I left off. Yeah. Like, I don't remember exactly what was going on in her thought mm -hmm. process, so it's good to just refresh. Yeah. Even the, the, the damn title of the book, you don't know why it's called yeah, this for the until halfway through. Halfway through. But so she really does take her time, but it's yeah. it really helps the reader along yes. in how things are associated with yes. each other. 
Um, that's a good point. Cause, yeah, you could I, I, I remember bookmarking this too, because um, I don't dog you, because I'm not a fucking soulless no, you're not. hack monster we see human. You. We see you, we dog see you. ears. Keep your fucking out. I did kind of the same thing, except I was just like, I'm just going to bookmark this page, because I know every time I go back to it, I'm going to have to read from the top of the page down. But yeah, not much more than that. Mm -hmm. I wouldn't have to flip back to the beginning of a, of the, the whole sentence. Mm -hmm. Um... Which would be all the way back. Which would be all the way back to the book if we're counting not periods or whatever. That's fine. Which we're not. Oh my god. Can't even. Um, <laughs> but you will. With you two, I can't even. Um, anyway, but um, but yeah, but that's all you need to read because it is multi-layered. It's like if you want to use cross stitch, I'm gonna say it is like a, a, a laminated pastry. What kind of laminated pastry? Uh, I'm just gonna go straight croissant. I see no reason okay. to to. Uh, uh, Go any further than Chocolate, that? Chocolate, almonds. No, just straight croissant. Okay. Just nothing fancy about it. You just you got your block of butter, which I'm going to call like the plot of this, the actual meaty plot. You got your dough, which is her consciousness, and you fold it over, and you roll it out, and then you fold it over, and you roll it out, and you have all these lovely, lovely little layers. And so at any moment in time, you're getting just a little bit of butter and a little bit of steam fluff, and it's just mwah. Um, at any moment in time, it's evenly distributed. That's beautiful. Um, Thank you. That's great. Thank you. Do you know what I want? What do you want? I want you to make a croissant that's big enough that you can just put me inside of it and I'll take a nap. I think I can do that, but I'm going to need probably an actual steamroller. I guess my final question for you, mm -hmm. final consideration, mm -hmm. um, and this sort of goes back to the title mm -hmm. and thinking about why she chose to call this what she did. Mm -hmm. Do you think that this is an ultimately hopeful book? Do you think it bodes well for the character, for us, for humanity? Do, okay, does the character feel hopeful at the end of the book? Does, does the narrator herself? I would say no. I would also say no. Um, are, but are we supposed supposed to? For, I would because say... Because, for example, like the title, Duck's Newburyport, and we're just going to spoil it. That's fine. Um, so, it those words are associated with each other, and you first read them in like page ninety something, yeah, it comes and up you very perk early. up. But but you don't know the full story yeah. till halfway through, yeah. and it's the story of so when the narrator's mother was very young, she chased ducks into a pond because she was like in love with ducks, mm -hmm. but she couldn't swim, so she just like wanders into this pond and mm -hmm. starts drowning, and then her older sister Abby. Mm -hmm the narrator's Aunt Abby, um, who is also can't swim, very afraid of water. Yeah. Despite all that, she runs in after her baby sister and saves her from dying. Also like an ASAP rock song. Anyway. I think that this is, all, it's hopeful, but with a lot of conditions, because I do think in like the last final, final five pages, yeah. there's like a sense of closure and there is a period. There, is a, there period, is a period. A light at the end we of the tunnel. We can at least agree on one period in the story. Yes. Um, so there is a sense of closure. She does feel like she is able to move on, but not without acknowledging a whole lot of pain and trauma. Yeah, and I guess, I and guess you have to sit with that. Yeah, and you have to sit with that. You know what? Change my mind. In this moment in time, it is a hopeful book because of that okay. story. Because. I am going to go, this is a little underdeveloped, so I apologize. Because she chased, um, because someone, someone did something risky and stupid because of something they love. Like, we love to eat and fuck, and that has kind of fucked up the world, right? Build big bridges big, and build towers. Build bridges and towers and bombs and plastics. Um, um, not even really knowing what we were doing. Um... We have now put our entire selves in danger. In danger, now it is up to us to try and prevent that same thing from happening. Even though we are scared, even though we have our own anxieties, even though we should not be able to, mm -hmm. arguably, succeed, um, she does. Mm -hmm. And that kind of, without that, we don't have this book. Mm -hmm. I just want to say, um, just real quick recommendation. Yes, read this book. Go read it. It's a thousand pages. It's lovely. It's um, if you're buying it in America, it's from Biblioasis. Also, Oasis. if you're planning on being quarantined on a cruise, <laughs> this will take care of you for oh, a while. Matt, hundred percent recommendation, right? Yes. 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 Okay. Cool. Um, thanks for watching, 
everyone. Yeah, you made it this far. You made it this far. Who we the... wish we could offer you a lemon meringue pie, but we can't. It's lemon dr drizzle cake. Lemon drizzle. Lemon drizzle cake. It's not even a fucking meringue on it. So thank you for following. Um, we will update this as much as we can. Um, we do work a lot. You work two. I, I work, work three jobs. We have yeah. We have five jobs between us. Um, if, we're gonna, if this if this becomes a job, maybe we can get rid of one of those jobs. Maybe. And do more of this. Yeah. So I hope you guys like it. Um, more buffoonery and goonery. Mm, and tomfoolery. Tomfoolery. Cut, print, streaming. Boom, boom, boom. Okay. <laughs>